Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Wallace, pastor of Redemption to the Nation's Church. And listen, today I'm going to be bringing a message that I trust will bring life and hope and peace to your heart. We need peace in these troubled times. We can find it in the word of the Lord. I want you to call your friends, your family, let them know that this message is getting ready to be preached. I want them to join in and be blessed by it as well. Now hang on to the end. I'm coming back to pray for you and your need. Can't wait to see you then. May the Lord bless you. Let's jump into the word today. Now this message, I'm just giving you some uh, uh, information that you probably don't even care about. This is something God put in my spirit last week. And um, I, I thought I would go another direction today, but the Lord, I felt like the Lord just said to me, it's prophetic for this house. And I just want to release it. And those who are going to catch it are the ones that it will manifest in. Mm. You have to mix the word with faith for the word to work for you. Come on, how many know you can't just hear a message? Or do, you can't just listen to a message. You got to hear a message. Jesus said, he or she who has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. Why would he say that? Because you can't, listen, a word can't come to pass that you haven't heard. Faith cometh by, oh, I told you, and hearing by the Word of God. So when the Word comes, faith rises and we can believe. And believing the Word that's been given causes the Word to manifest in our life. So I just want to release this to you today and then I'm, I'm going to get out your hair or your weave, your extensions, your toupee, your ball spot, whatever you got. Come on. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Notice, he did it and he taught it. Some people can teach it but can't do it. Others try to do it but they don't teach accurately. It's not just what you do, it's what you teach. And it's not just what you teach, it's what you do. There ought to be a marriage, come on in here. There ought to be a marriage of doing and teaching. Is anyone else other than me tired of a church that can teach it but can't demonstrate it? So Jesus did it and he taught it. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the, to the apostles whom he had chosen. Watch this. Verse 3, this is what I want you to see. To whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Say infallible proofs. Being seen by them during what? 40 days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And, and this is... Uh, this is where I want to just launch from today. We'll see where the Lord takes us. This is not a sermon. This is just something I believe God spoke to me for your life and for our church. And I want to talk about beyond the resurrection. Two weeks ago, we shouted and we praised God for an empty tomb. But where do we go from there? And what's next for the people of God? And Acts chapter 1 tells us there was more beyond the empty tomb. And I want to talk about what happens in our lives beyond the resurrection and particularly this season that we're in. And I will share this with you when God gave this to me three weeks ago for this house and for our church family. No one, including myself, knew what was coming this week in regards to the attack on Israel. I just believe God's confirming it already. I want to talk about it today. Help me, Lord. Help them in Jesus' name. And the family said amen. amen. You can be seated. I got it, Rick. Thank you, sir. Well, you're so kind. So if y'all want to know what I'm going to preach today, it's on that piece of paper right there. So I'll say that and get out y'all's way, okay? Several weeks ago, we gathered and we celebrated an empty tomb. And we praised God for the power of resurrection and we, we just gave God great shouts of praise because the tomb is empty and death's been defeated and the cross couldn't keep him down, down and Rome couldn't get rid of him and he's alive, amen? amen? And not because I believe in being curt or, you know, uh, Christianese. I just think it's important for us to be reminded he's still alive. Yeah. That two weeks after Easter, he's still celebrated as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The tomb is still empty. Amen. Jesus is still the conquering King. Yes. 
and there's nobody that can get rid of him and nobody can kill him and nobody can do away with him. He is alive. The tomb is still empty. Jesus is still alive. And yet I feel like sometimes the church, um, we have no problem celebrating the empty tomb and we have no problem and we shouldn't have a problem praising God for the power of resurrection. But I find myself asking the question, where do we go from here? What do we do now that we are a church who believes in the resurrection of Jesus and we have recognized that he's alive? How many know that's not a finish line, that is a launching pad? And by all accounts on, uh, by all accounts on social media at least, the, the, the days and uh, the weeks after Resurrection Sunday, churches were full of people. There was a bunch of sinners that came to an altar and on social media, all kind of pastors talking about how many people got saved, and I'm grateful for it. I want you to know I'm on Team Jesus, and I don't just get excited about what I see and happen in this house. I'm thankful for all the people who came to an altar in a church and gave their life to Christ, and I need somebody to help me praise God for that, and I need somebody to help me celebrate the wins that we had in the kingdom of God. But the kingdom antagonist and the spiritual purist in me asked the question, what now? Full altars, full churches, we brag, we talk about what God did on Resurrection Sunday, and I say, wonderful, now what? What happens after the resurrection? Where do we go after the empty tomb? For many, it is as if the resurrection is the end of the gospel story. And while the empty tomb is certainly the greatest and most significant and cataclysmic miracle in the history of humanity, it is never, the empty tomb is never to be construed as the end of anything. Because the resurrection of Jesus and the raising to life of his dead body was the beginning of the greatest period in history. And he did not just rise from the dead and float off to heaven hoping that a few crazy disciples would step out on a limb and follow his newfound religion. Acts tells us he rose from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he stayed on this earth, listen to this, in a glorified body. For 40 days, he made himself known to be alive and he substantiated his claim with many infallible proofs. Think of that. 40 days before his ministry launched, he was in the chilly waters of a Jordan River and he came up out of the river and the Father spoke from heaven, said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately after God told him who he was, the Bible said the Spirit led him to the wilderness and Satan for 40 days questioned his identity, his authenticity, and his claim to be the Messiah. Satan said, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, for 40 days the enemy assaulted his mind trying to get him to doubt who he was. But at the end of his ministry, he took 40 days again and he went around telling everybody, I told you so. You understand that the enemy always wants you to doubt what God says about you. But you've got to have a season in your life where you move from doubting into a season of confessing. I may not feel like I am who he said I am, but I'm still here. And it qualifies me to testify of the faithfulness of God. Can anybody testify? You've been through a season of doubting, but God has done some remarkable things in your life. And you've shifted from being double-minded into a place of testifying. I told you so, devil. Oh, God, I better quit here. But I told you not to to mess with my family. I told you not to mess with my children. I told you not to mess with my city. Every promise of God is yes and amen. 40 days he walked the width and breadth of Jerusalem demonstrating who he was. Jesus is alive and he has a group of people who follow him. Now we know that in that group were 12. Judas is now dead. And I don't have time to preach that, but Judas didn't have to die. Judas killed himself. 
Judas killed himself because he couldn't forgive himself, but he could have lived had he went to Jesus because Jesus will forgive anybody. Jesus never required blind trust. His claim to be the Christ was substantiated by many pieces of irrefutable evidence that was entered into the record of his life. And everyone in this room and watching me online is not called to blind trust. They're called to examine the accessible evidence of his claim that he is indeed the Messiah. And if you examine the evidence, you will come away with the right conclusion that there's nobody like him. There were meetings. There were miracles. There were encounters for 40 days that knocked the doubt out of the doubters. You understand, after Jesus rose, there were even some among his 11 disciples who were left who were still struggling with doubt. Even after he rose from the dead, they were struggling. Is he really who he said he is? Come on in here and talk to me, Thomas. Thomas called Didymus. Thomas, we call him the doubter. Thomas King James says Thomas called Didymus, and Didymus is the word that is used to describe double or a twin, one translation says. But interesting, interestingly enough, Didymus is from the same root word that is used in the epistle of James when James the apostle says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let him think not he should receive anything from God. James wasn't talking to hell-bound sinners. He was talking to people in the church who come to church and on Sunday they're up, on Monday they're down, on Tuesday they're in, on Wednesday they're out. They go back and forth and depending on which way the wind is blowing, that's the kind of direction they take in life and they're double-minded. There's two minds inside their one mind. Oh God, I'm preaching here. Thomas had a double, there was a double of Thomas. I'm not even sure Thomas was a twin to another brother. I know some people believe that, but there are many theologians that believe like I do who believe that Thomas was not really the twin of another brother. There was two Thomases at work. Oh God. There was a Thomas who believed God and a Thomas who couldn't believe. There was a Thomas who was in and a Thomas who was out. And Jesus said, I don't want anybody who's been sent in my name operating in a double mind. So Thomas, come on over here and put your hands in these nail prints. Come on over here and put your hand in my side. And when Thomas touched his scars, the Bible said in John chapter 20, Thomas fell down and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus looked at him and said, Thomas, you believe because you saw it. But blessed are they who do not see these scars. Blessed are they who do not touch these healed wounds and still believe. What are you preaching pastor? I'm telling you God doesn't want your shama. God doesn't want you sitting in pews in a church on Sunday believing one day and not believing the next. Up one Monday, down by Tuesday. He wants to knock the doubt out of the doubter and remove the skepticism from the skeptic and show you that he is who he said he is and will do what he said he could do. So, Jesus appears to many. I'm not going to go through it all. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute I'm teaching this. Jesus appears to many. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to at least three other ladies in Mark's gospel. Think of this. I thought about this this morning. They're on their way to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus. Why would they anoint a dead body? Because it's beginning to stink. And they cared enough about the body of Christ, help me Holy Ghost, to cover up the stench. On their way to the tomb to cover up the stench, they thought about the stone. And they said in Mark's gospel, who will roll this stone away? And when they got to the tomb, the stone had already been rolled away and they found the most amazing thing that happened. He was not there, he was alive. I thought about that and I thought, you know what? Thank God for the sisters 
and the brothers, I suppose, as well. Whoever is interested in covering up the stench in the body of Christ, there are a whole lot of people who want to contribute to the smell. And there's a lot that can stink. And y'all don't have to say amen. I'm going to preach it anyway. There's a lot that can start stinking in the body of Christ. There's a lot of people who've got nasty attitudes. There's a lot of people who are know-it-alls. There are a lot of social media prophets who are confusing masses and flocks of people. I'm thankful for the sisters and the brothers who understand that the anointing can cover the stench that we sometimes create in the body of Christ. And if you will concern yourself with covering up the stench God is powerful enough to move the stone that you are worried about at the tomb. And he makes himself known to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He makes himself known to James. This is where I want to go for a minute. He makes himself known to the ten disciples. He makes himself known to 500. According to, we don't talk about this, but according to 1 Corinthians 15, 500 people saw Jesus before Jesus went back to heaven. He makes himself known to 120 on a hillside before he steps on a cloud and goes back home. He makes himself known. And he says, wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. He's not hiding. For 40 days, he's saying, here I am, I'm alive, and I told you so. I told you they'd take my life, but if I lay it down, I got the power to raise it back up again. It's the miracles, the meetings. After the resurrection of Jesus, the evidence began to mount. The number of disciples began to increase. There were many who have rejected and refused the good news of the story of Jesus. Many have denied the existence and the life of Christ and have repudiated the record of his death, burial, and resurrection found in the Gospels. They treat the truth as a fable and a fairy tale that is believed only by those who have been brainwashed by the Bible. But hear the words of the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter 1 verse 16, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power of our, of, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Peter, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The apostle Peter said that, that he was an eyewitness of his majesty. And before some skeptic writes off the testimony of Peter as a mere follower of the man Jesus, or perhaps you believe that Peter somehow had something to gain financially by testifying and participating in this lie called the gospel. I want to tell you that the only thing Peter won for his testimony was the death of a martyr. You understand that Peter was a terrified turncoat who denied Jesus three times before the crucifixion and revelation, resurrection, and after Jesus was raised from the dead, Peter would become so convinced of the lordship of Jesus and the life of Christ that he would be given the death sentence of crucifixion himself. Peter was crucified, except there is one caveat to his crucifixion. He refused to be cru crucified as his savior and his Lord was, and he requested that he be crucified upside down because he did not consider himself worthy to die in the same manner of Christ. If the testimony of Peter is not enough, infallible proof, then consider the testimony of James, the half-brother of Jesus, whose scripture records struggled with the claim that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. James saw Jesus as family. Don't miss this. James the just history would call him. He believed that Jesus was just a half-brother. James saw Jesus, his younger half-brother. James saw Jesus in his humanity. And for all these reasons, James struggled with the idea that Jesus was the son of the living God. But after the resurrection, during the 40 days in which he revealed his power and made himself known by the many infallible proofs, James, the half-brother of Jesus, saw that Jesus was not just his half-brother biologically. No, there was something beyond the biological quality that James began to see. He began to see a spiritual and supernatural quality about Christ that made him more than just a sibling. It meant that Jesus was, in fact, 
Not just the son of Mary and Joseph. Jesus was the son of the living God. James, who for most of his life was not convinced of Jesus' lordship, would eventually die the death of a martyr because he was so convinced that Jesus was Lord. This James, in fact, would become a martyr. Listen to this story. I, I don't usually read these stories. I want you to hear this. A great Bible historian wrote about the martyrdom of James. And this is what he said about James. After a while, James' influence becomes so strong that even some of the rulers believed. It horrified the scribes and the Pharisees. The historian recounts, they became afraid that soon people would begin to flock to Jesus as the Christ because of the testimony of James. Perhaps because of his strict observance of the law, the Pharisees thought that they could get James to discourage the people from believing on Jesus. They asked James to stand at the pinnacle of the temple on Passover and to speak to the crowd to which James happily agreed. They brought him to the top of the pinnacle and they shouted to him from, the, from below, O oh, righteous one, James the just, in whom we are able to place great confidence. The people are being led astray after Jesus Christ, the crucified one. So declare to us, James, what is this way, Jesus? Obviously, this wasn't very wise, wrote the historian. This wasn't very wise for the Pharisees to do. James, ready to take full advantage of such a wonderful opportunity as this, his words are written and etched in history. He replied to them, why do you ask me about Jesus, the son of man? He sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power, and he will soon come on the clouds of heaven. The Pharisees were horrified, but the people were not. The people on the ground began shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. The Pharisees, realizing that the awful mistake they had made, began to backfire, began crying out, Oh no, the righteous one, James the just, has also believed the lie. So the next obvious thing to do was to push him down from the temple, letting the people know exactly what happens to those who dare to believe in Jesus. They climbed the temple as the people shouted Hosanna. They reached the top and they grabbed James and they cast him from the pinnacle of the temple to the ground, which did not kill him. He rose to his knees and as he bled, began to pray for those who heard him. I beg of you, Lord God, our Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This would not do. The Pharisees on the ground began to stone James while he was praying, while those from the roof rushed down to join the execution. One of the priests, however, a son of the Rechabites mentioned by Jeremiah the prophet shouted, stop what you are doing, the righteous one. James the just is praying for you, but it was too late. A launderer took out one of the clubs that he used to beat the clothes and smashed James on the side of his head, killing him with one blow. Does that sound like a man who was not convinced? Who all of his life wandered through his relationship with Jesus, thinking him to be merely a half-brother, only to see the infallible proof for 40 days that changed his mind about this man, Jesus. What's the point today, Pastor? The point today is this. Men stared death in the face and kept their faith they stared death in the face and kept their faith because they were so convinced of his infallible proof that he was indeed the Lord of glory. And two weeks ago while I was praying, I heard the Lord say this to me. For the, I want you to mark these 40 days. Because just as I did in the days of my resurrection, I'm going to make myself known to my people again. If I could just be real, some of us are shifty, double-minded and full of doubt. Spiritual enough to claim heaven is home, but not convinced enough to get fully persuaded. Double-minded, unstable in all of our ways. And I want, to hear, I want you to hear me say this to you today. He cares about that. He cares that the church, 
Do you understand that you really can't? We, we were singing, taking the land, taking the land, taking the land. You can't take the land if you don't know it belongs to you. It belongs to the kingdom. We're not just singing songs, making decrees. We're moving into a season, I'm just telling you this, this is the great disruption going on in the church world at this moment that we're living. We're moving into a season where usual church services won't help the believer remain in the strength they need for the fight they're in. I believe with all of my heart we're going to begin to see testimonies, hear testimonies, and witness infallible proof in your lives that Jesus is who he said he was. That it's not just stepping out on a limb, trying this thing out, seeing where it might take us, but a conviction that settles so deep in our spirit that people even in the face of death, would keep their faith. Now, I know there are people in here today who say, don't talk to me about dying. We live in a free country. You better enjoy every minute of it you have right now because it's not promised forever. And while we sit over here and people argue, I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about the church, argue over the color of carpet, all argue over what kind of songs we're gonna sing, argue over what kind of lights and haze are on the stage. There are people in underground churches in China who in the face of, I, I got a text from one of our spiritual daughters from Pakistan, and in the face of death and under the threat of all kind of harm, they continue to meet and preach the gospel, and they're not afraid of the devil and they're not afraid of death. I tell you, church, there's about to be a shift. The shift is on. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken, including this modern day Sunday morning religion that we call Christianity. Christianity was never birthed out of convenience. It was never made for comfort. We're not on a cruise ship. It's a battleship. Slap your neighbor, tell them, neighbor, get in this thing. My God, we don't need to be shaken. We don't have to be shaken. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But if you're established in faith in Christ, you won't shake when everything else shakes. Time would not permit me to tell of the martyrdom of the rest of the apostles, of Paul himself, or early church fathers like Polycarp, all who stared death in the face, kept their testimony of Christ under the penalty of death because they were so convinced Jesus was who he said he was. So I asked the question, what now? Where do we go from the empty tomb? What do we do after Resurrection Sunday? Because I tell you this, Christianity is more than a celebration about an empty tomb. It is the advancing of the kingdom of God in the day and hour we are living. I, get the, I ask these questions sometimes because I get the feeling in many churches that don't know, we don't know where to go after Resurrection Sunday. Perhaps this is why many people come to church on Easter that don't come any other time of the year. Because they come on a day where we unabatedly and unashamedly embrace the notions of the supernatural power of God. We talk about the dead king rising and they come to hear that story and we open our heart on Resurrection Sunday to the possibilities of new life and divine miracles. And maybe they don't come back to church because every other Sunday we speak the dying diatribe of Christianese. And we fill our churches with hollow religious rhetoric that is as empty as a pauper's purse and a beggar's bank account. I want to remind you today that your faith does not stand in the wisdom of a man. Your faith stands in the power of an almighty God. We're not somehow cradled in some religious fantasy. Your faith stands in the power of God. God, I believe, put this word in my spirit because he's getting ready to knock the doubt out of doubters. He's getting ready to knock the skepticism out of skeptics. And the reason he's doing this is because the day and hour we're living in, it requires...
requires more than a double-minded approach to the person of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. It requires somebody thoroughly convinced that he is the Christ. So here's what I want to say, and I'm done. Prepare for infallible, undeniable, forthcoming evidence that is going to be added to the record of your life that is intended to remove the double-mindedness and the skepticism. Well, I'm wrestling. I understand. There's a lot of people wrestling, some even deconstructing. Don't get me started. I don't think we're really deconstructing. I think we're destroying. What are you going to do when those children you've been praying for all of a sudden do get saved? What, what are you going to do when those tumors, masses, cancers... diagnosis are suddenly reversed. Thomas, what are you going to do when he takes away the reason you had to doubt? Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And the reason some of you have been going through a testing of your faith is not because God wants you to stay in the place of testing. He actually wants to settle you, as Devin said last Sunday. Because a faith that has not been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. I don't fault Thomas. Come help me, musician. Please, sir. I didn't even notice who was playing today. Who's playing the piano anyway? Aaron, God bless you, son. Where did he go? He just vanished. Oh, he's like Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> he disappeared and reappeared. Glory. <laughs> Infallible proof, I told you. <laughs> I think some people in this room, precious people in this room, have struggled in faith. Struggled in what to believe and how to believe. I believe God just wants to get a hold of your heart. I just believe we're in a season after the resurrection. I just believe we're in a season where there's some proving going on. I believe you're gonna see it on the news. They don't understand it and they don't know how to articulate it. Rick and I were driving down the interstate. We've got some friends in government and they said, how many missiles last night? Over 200 missiles last night shot into the airspace of Jerusalem. 99 point some percent were completely obliterated and never got there. Now, wait, wait, wait. Why are you saying that? Because if you don't read the Bible, you might think, oh, that's cool technology. But if you've ever read the Old Testament when Israel was surrounded and it looked like they were going under and God did something crazy like confuse the enemy, when I, watch, when I watch that stuff happen on Fox or seeing whatever it is I see it on, I say, look at God. He's still protecting his people. He's still watching over his land. There's still the apple of his eye. Somebody shout amen or something. I see the intervention of Yahweh. Woo! I see angels on the scene, working in unseen realms. Why does that matter? Because if he's working over there, he's working in your house. He's working on your children. He's working in your body. Somebody's going to get healed of cancer in this season. Somebody's tumor is drying up. Somebody's sickle cell anemia is not going to stay in their body. There's healing coming. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Your faith shall not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. I'm not just trusting a preacher's sermon. I'm trusting infallible proof. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Well, are you hoping? I'm not just hoping anything. 
I'm a living witness. He's alive. Some of you haven't seen a witness in a while. Some of us are trusting, and I've got no problem with t- trusting a 20-year-old testimony. You just need an updated testimony. That might be why some of you are in trouble. Because you need an updated testimony. If you never had any trouble and you never had God fix it, then you might keep on thinking, well, 30 years ago he did it, but I don't know if he's still doing it. Well, you're in a mess now, and the only one who's going to get you out is the same one that got you out three decades ago, and he doesn't want your faith to get dead and dry and crusty. He's still alive. He's still got all power, and he's still on the throne. Prepare for meetings. Touch your neighbor, tell him, get prepared. No, no, come on, this is not rhetorical. Touch your neighbor and and just prophesy, say, prepare for meetings. What kind of meetings? You're gonna have encounters with Jesus. Oh, pastor's so excited, I'm prophesying. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. You're out of your mind. Call my friend David Safafa. I went to Israel two years ago. I thought I was going on some cute little joy tour. I met with messianic pastors in Israel who put it on the line every week to have church in the city of Jerusalem. I sat with a group of people at a table and I was embarrassed. I was personally embarrassed. They brought us over there and said, we brought you over here to teach these pastors how to grow churches. Shut up. I sat down with a man who pastors in Gaza. The week before I was in the meeting with him, he was having church teaching the gospel. A missile landed in the alley of that church and it did not detonate. And they ran in and said, What was the thud? They said it was a missile. Do you think they all took pictures and jumped on Instagram and said, look what the Lord has done. No, he kept preaching that message until he got finished. And afterwards they said, look what the Lord has done. I tell you, we want want to go viral, but nobody wants the victory. I'm sitting at the table with these men who pastor over there. David Safafa sitting right beside me, a tall, strapping Ethiopian, Orthodox Jew who had an incredible legal career and as a lawyer worked in the administration of Benjamin Netanyahu. And one day, say, prepare yourself. Come on, tell your neighbor, prepare yourself for meetings. One day, he has a dream. In the dream, this Ethiopian Orthodox Jew from Ethiopia, he said to me sitting at the table that day, Bishop, Yeshua came to me in a dream. I had repudiated his name all my life. We had rejected the story of Christ. My entire family had rejected Jesus. But that man came to me in a dream. He said, stand up, Pastor Mike. He said, I said, no, I'm crying by this point. I said, what did Jesus say to you? He said, he put his hands on my shoulders and said, precious David, I love you. And I want to change your life. In a dream. He met Jesus and woke up and has been serving Jesus ever since. His family left him. His family alienated him. But Jesus came to his wife and children and they all got saved and born again. That ain't it. Tell your neighbor, prepare yourself. Every time I say that, I feel faith rise. Tell your, fa- tell your neighbor, say, prepare yourself 
for meetings with Jesus. At the onset of COVID, he had another dream. Stand up, Pastor Mike. Jesus comes to him in the dream. Jesus doesn't wear glasses, but I do. He lays his hands on David's shoulders. Precious David, I love you, but you're not doing what I want you to do with your life. And in the dream, he says, Yeshua, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to plant a church in Israel. You want me to leave my legal career and go plant a church? That's what I want you to do, David. In the middle of COVID, that's what I want you to do, David. He goes and he plants a church in Jerusalem. He showed me the pictures. I've shared them with you before. They have beat up chairs. They had beat up chairs. They had beat up instruments and they were all together in the middle of COVID in what looked like a ragtag situation and they were so full of joy which is why I don't understand why some people come to church and they're mad about everything you ought to put a smile on your face say amen well I'm mad they didn't call me I'm mad they talked about me I'm, I'm glad Jesus is alive and he saved my soul get over it Get over it. I sat at that table weeping. Before I left for Israel, the Lord told me to take an amount of money from the church. Y'all had given it. Some of you had given it. People said, Pastor, we know you're going. We want you to do what God tells you to do. And some people sowed into that. I had that gift ready. I didn't even know where we were sending it. When I sat down with him, the Lord said to me, see them chairs, buy them new ones. See those instruments, buy them new ones. I have no clue David Safafa had been praying for more chairs and more instruments. I said, David, we're gonna wire you this amount of money and I want you to buy new chairs and new instruments. Can I tell you what's happening today while we're over here? I hope all of you've got joy. I hope all of you've got happiness. If you don't, you helped a group of people over in Jerusalem who are sitting on new chairs and have new instruments and they're praising God because Jesus is still meeting with his people. What kind of encounter do you have to have before we stop having religion and we get so full of the fire of God? Can we chill out a little bit? Chill in heaven, we're not there yet. We got a job to do right now. We'll sing on the side of the river while the ages roll. Until then, somebody needs to sing. Until then, somebody needs to pray. Until then, somebody needs to prophesy. Prepare for meetings. Prepare for encounters. Prepare for miracles. I believe we're in a season of infallible proof right now. I, know, I don't preach like this all the time. I'm just telling you, heaven's opening. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord and you say, I don't believe in the coming of the Lord. I got a different eschatology. That's great. The Bible's right and you're wrong. He's coming back. Until he comes, he will not have a people full of double-mindedness. Which way is the wind blowing today? That's our new direction, not me. I have set my sail in the direction of the ancient wind, the Ruach of God. Let it blow where it blows. Stand with me. I have nothing to pray except God would fulfill what I believe he spoke to my heart for each of us. 
that he would make himself known to be fully alive to you and your family in this season by many infallible proofs. Martin, Catherine, come here, please. Give me some oil. Love you all. If you got to go, get your babies. Love you. See you Wednesday night. Have a great weekend. But I'm going to obey the Lord here. I just believe you need some infallible proof. And it's coming. I don't even know what I'm talking about, but it's fixing to happen. Lord, I come into agreement with them right now. Jesus, by the power of God, lift your hands, church. Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Lift your hands. If you're staying, I need you to pray in the Holy Spirit with me. Just, I just feel like there's a release that's coming from the Holy Spirit because faith is going to rise here. Faith, there, there's a fine tuning going on in the Spirit of God. And you can't run like Devin's been talking about. You cannot run in this race right now without having some proof and the removal of some skepticism and cynicism. I'm telling you, you gotta be real careful right now. I don't, I don't know who's got it, but I'm gonna tell you, the cure for it is not a conversation. The cure for it is infallible proof. Lift your hands if you believe in God for something that only God can do right now. Come on, lift your hands if you believe in God to do something that only God can do right now. Terry and Mike, lift your hands. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost. I thank you, Holy Ghost, for Yes, I see the family tree getting wiped out by the power of God, and God is starting a new family tree. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. If somebody's got their hand up near you, take it right now. Infallible proof. Come on. Infallible proof. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, you heard her. And she can't take back what she asked for. You've been reminded of it this day, Holy Spirit. I thank you. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Come on, pray. Oh, God, do it today. God, do it today. Take your neighbor by the hand. Holy Spirit, make Jesus known. Make Jesus known. Come here. Come here, sweetheart. Come here, family. Oh, oh. Oh, Baba Hasapu Handa Tabra. Oh, glory. It's already done. It's already done. Lift your hands and worship Jesus in this room. He heard you. He heard both of you. He heard you. And the heavens have been cleared. The runway that was foggy has been cleared. I see a landing strip and the miracle is getting ready to land on it. Oh, somebody lift your voice. Somebody lift your voice. Somebody, I, I need some people to begin to pray. The Holy Ghost is here. Heaven is opening up. Let it open. Let it open. Let it open. Oh God, open up our hearts. Oh God, open up our hearts. Oh God, open up our hearts. Touch Sister Linda today. Oh, I feel some strength coming on you, Sister Linda. Dunwoodies, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. Hallelujah. 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 Come here. Come here. You served everybody else's vision. God is about to send people to serve yours. Oh. I need you to lift your voice. I need you to lift your voice. Come here, sweet lady. Come here, sweet lady. Oh, God. I thank you that this is the last day she carries this weight. She's been carrying loose her. Huh? 
by the power of the Holy Ghost. I need some men to stay with me. The Holy Ghost is moving in this room right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need every businessman or business lady in this church that owns their own business that is believing God in the midst of this inflation that your business will be blessed by the power of God. Lift your hands right now. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. If your hands are up, get in the altar right now. Hurry, hurry, come on. I'm just coming into agreement with you. Infallible proof, infallible proof, infallible proof, infallible proof. My God, my God. I lose success over every entrepreneur in this altar right now. The kingdom of God is going to manifest in your ministry, in your business, in your life. I need church, church, I need you to lift your voice right now. I need you to lift your voice in intercession right now. My God, I had no clue there were this many people. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Listen to me. I'm gonna pray for you in a minute, but I just, I'm getting this. I believe the Spirit of the Lord's just reminding me of this to give to you. Peter and John had a business of catching fish. Jesus didn't put them in another business. He just made them effective for the kingdom. This thing is about to get blessed, but you've gotta make the connection up here. It's not about our kingdom that we're building. It's about his kingdom that we're advancing and that is why favor is getting ready to come upon it. Holy Ghost. Brittany and Brad, what's fixing to happen is not on your radar, but it's supernatural alignment. Holy Ghost, do it in the name of Jesus. Just lift your voice all over this room right now. Favor, favor, favor favor of God, favor of God. Every business, I bless it for the glory of God. 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 Father, put a grace to break generational things, not only off his own life, but off of those you're calling him to minister to. I call you into kingdom business for the rest of your days. Holy Ghost, work on it. Work on it for him. Get the glory. Lift your hands, sir. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless what these hands get put to in Jesus' name. Come on, pray, 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 pray. Spirit of God, do it. Spirit of God, do it. Spirit of God, do it. Well, I trust that the Word of God is working in your heart in this moment. I know the Word works. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Maybe something said today has touched your heart. Maybe you feel like you are so far away from God. How could I ever get right with God? Friend, I want to tell you, there is a way to get right with God. It's through His Son, Jesus. Today, if you'll turn your heart and your life over to Him, I don't care what you've done and how bad it was, how long you've been doing it and how messed up you feel. Jesus is a friend to sinners. He'll come into your life. He'll turn it all the way around and change it. I believe by the Spirit of God, He's doing that right now. Let's pray. Open your heart and say, Dear God, come into my life and forgive me of all my sin. Lord Jesus, I need you to wash me and make me new. I confess that I've been a sinner, and today I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Turn my life over to you, Lord Jesus. Come in and be the king of my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know today's not the finish line. It's just the beginning. Go to kevinwallace.tv. Just drop us a line on our prayer request area. Let us know that you got saved. You gave your life to Christ. We want to make sure you have a Bible. We want to make sure you get plugged into a good Bible-believing church full of the Spirit of God. Listen, the journey has just begun, and the best days of your life are in front of you. We're praying for you, for you here at Kevin Wallace Ministries. Can't wait to see what God does in your life. We love you all. God bless.